Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation and the, the great introduction. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm uh, Mike Saylor. I'm from UC San Diego, um, and I'm going to be talking about um, uh, nanomaterials, uh, primarily silicon-based nanomaterials. I have to get through a requirement of my university first. And um, next, I just want to spend about uh, two minutes talking about how nanotechnology is used in medicine. I know this is a, in this bios community, uh, this, you don't need to be reminded of this probably, uh, but uh, it is nice to kind of know that there are nanoparticles out there that are currently approved for use in humans for either diagnostic, uh, such as uh, Faradex, which is actually now off the market, um, but it was approved anyway as a nanoparticle uh, for uh, imaging, improving image contrast and MRI. Uh, Abraxane, a cancer therapeutic, is a nanoparticle containing paclitaxel. And, and Doxel, the cancer therapeutic that uh, delivers um, doxorubicin in a liposomal formulation. And, and, and actually, Doxel is so old, it's now off patent, uh, and it's still being used uh, to treat cancer. So uh, nanoparticles and nanomedicine has been with us for quite some time, even though we don't always know it. Um, the general concept for nanomedicine, uh, and I'm, I'm illustrating this with a, a, an animation from Justin Lowe, who works with Sangeeta Bhatia, one of my collaborators at MIT, um, is you have some kind of spinach on your nanoparticle that does something to help it find its way um, into the body, and uh, the animation is showing actually a tumor penetrating uh, nanostructure that Sangeeta's group works on. Uh, in many ways, uh, you can think about those kinds of structures as mini robots. Uh, they have some programming uh, built into them based on the chemistry, typically on the surface, uh, and uh, they have some function that they're programmed to perform. And, and so I, I thought I'd start my, my talk with this uh, slide here from Isaac Asimov's uh, very famous uh, book made into a movie called iRobot. How many people saw it? Oh, nobody wants to admit it. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the one with Will Smith. But the, the book was a lot better than the movie, I think. Uh, and so uh, Isaac Asimov came up with what he called his three laws of robotics. I'll, I'll put them up here. Um, and the idea was when he wrote his novels that, you know, this is sort of a futuristic idea that you're going to have these uh, automatic creatures moving around, and they'd have to follow some kinds of rules in their programming uh, to keep them from, from hurting people or doing the wrong thing. And so uh, Isaac Asimov's three laws of robots. Uh, first one was, you know, robot can't do any harm to people. Uh, the second, it has to obey the orders of people, um, except if an order would cause it to hurt another human. Uh, that was the first law was the supreme law, you can do no harm. Um, and then three was then, uh, given that you follow one and two, then protect your own um, existence so you can keep doing what you're, um, they paid, paid you to do. Uh, and so I've uh, kind of, revise this to my three laws of nanorobotics uh, for nanoparticles, if you'll bear with me. I know this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it, it's, it, it has a point. Um, and so the first law really has to be exactly the same. And, and really, in the nano world and in, in, in the medical uh, field, we're talking about really toxicity. So um, the, the, the nanomaterial should not be harmful to human beings. It needs to be able to do what it's, it's, it's supposed to do. Um, and so uh, that's really the medical prescription, right? Uh, do no harm. Um, the second uh, law is, uh, you know, obeying the orders, which really is following its programming. And as, as I alluded to in my first slide, the programming for a nanoparticle is not done in lines of code. It's, it's done in, in, in molecules, really, and in, in the chemistry that we Im impart in our structures. And uh, finally, then, the, the robot has to follow a, a different, totally different law. You'll recall that the, the law the third law in Isaac Asimov's uh, iRobot series was the robot has to protect itself. But uh, if the robot is big, you can walk up to it and flip a power switch, turn it off, you can pick it up, move it around. Uh, if it's a nanoparticle, you can't control it, you can't go pick it up again after it's gotten loose. And so um, that's where my laws really divert from uh, Isaac Asimov's law, and that is that the nanomaterials have to self-destruct. They have to dissolve in the body or in, in the environment after they're doing their program function. So I'm gonna talk about um, how we will apply uh, nanomedicine to uh, this one specific problem, uh, which is uh, treating bacterial infections. Uh, 
And I thought as a touchstone, I'd, I'd just give a couple of uh, introductions to this. So we've got you know, a room here, roughly, probably about 25 seats across. So if you take the last row here, including my session chair, <laughs> and go straight back, everybody kind of in this, this, this last row or last two rows of seats, you guys are about 1 25th of this room. So if this room went to the hospital, you guys, regardless of what you came in for, <laughs> are gonna pick up a bacterial infection or viral infection in the hospital, a so-called healthcare-associated infection. And, and so that's really profound if you think about it, that, that you know, these institutions we built that basically um, help us uh, can also do harm, and that's because of this uh, persistence of bacteria and viruses in the environment and, and in, in, in sur on surfaces in healthcare environment. Um, and actually, of those, uh, so the, you know, typically, um, you know, one in 25 has one, gets one HAI, we call them, healthcare-associated infection. Um, there's, uh, you know, 700,000 of those in the U.S. per year, typically, um, and about 70,000 of those people then actually die during that hospitalization. So that's then, you know, kind of 10%, so it's of the 20 or so people in this row, that's you and Oh, Giuseppe, <laughs> you'll be the other one that gets to die. Because, not because of what you went to the hospital for, but because of a health care associated infection. And so, um, and one of the biggest problems with this area is that um, the resistance of bacteria is growing, as, as we all are aware. Um, and this is a chart that came out of a, a, a study that was done uh, for the Wellcome Trust in England uh, that was just looking at kind of the current state. Uh, that's the light blue here. So if you look at uh, you know, infections associated with um, antibi antibiotic resistance. So now we're just talking about resistance of, of these uh, bacteria, or you know, now we're specifically talking about bacteria uh, to uh, infections. Uh, it's about um, 700,000 people a year right now die because uh, of it having an, an, an antibiotic resistant uh, strains. Uh, you, we've all heard of MRSA, that's one of the, you know, strains, methicillin resistant, Staph aureus. Um, but the projection is that in 2050, this uh, number of people who will die from a resistant strain of bacteria uh, will actually exceed uh, cancer deaths, uh, at least our current cancer deaths. Right now, cancer deaths associated with uh, a lot more deaths than, say, uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, but the, the troubling thing maybe on the right-hand side is this chart here where you look at kind of the, the, the products that are being developed and what we're investing in these, uh, these problems. Um, in cancer, uh, currently, there's roughly 80, 800 um, new therapeutic products um, in development uh, to treat cancer. Um, and that contrasts that with antibiotics or new types of antibiotics that are really mainly targeted for antibiotic resistant um, species, uh, and it's less than 50. Um, the, the investment just by the National Institute of Health, the US uh, agency that is the largest investor in healthcare in, in the world, um, you know, 18 percent, 20 percent of their budget goes to cancer treatments, and less than uh, two, you know, only about one percent of their, their budget goes to antibiotics. Uh, and I, don't, I couldn't actually pull up the number for pharma VC investment, but for in the antibiotic field, typically in the VC investment community that, that, that works on, that, that invests in pharmaceuticals or pharma type products, uh, it's about five percent of their portfolio. So there's very underinvested area. Uh, and an emerging problem. And so um, now I'm gonna show you, uh, we're gonna talk more about Staph aureus in particular, and uh, uh, this uh, cartoon comes out of this, this reference here I, I, I stole from the literature, uh, and just wanna point out that, that there's lots of different ways that um, you can get sick from Staph aureus. Um, my talk, uh, the touchstone will be uh, lung infections, so Staph aureus invading the lungs. And uh, the, uh, chart I want to show is, is not really, it is a data chart, it's from my lab, um, but it's just meant as a, as a, you know, almost hypothetical type of a, a trace, and that any, any lab pretty much doing this kind of work would see something more or less uh, analogous, and that is that if you look at the survival of mice that are infected in the lungs with Staph aureus, uh, and these are not immune compromised mice, these mice have a competent immune system, so it's not like they're not able to fight it off, um, but if you give them a, the right, this is a, the, the model I'll be talking about today was, a, was targeted to be a lethal inf infection. Uh, and so within two days of the in inoculation or the infection with, in the lungs, uh, you, you lose 
uh, quite a bit, you know, only 20% or 30% of the mice survive. Um, after three days, uh, then you've got maybe 15 or 18% surviving. And um, actually, in, our, in the data I'm showing here, this basically corresponds to one mouse. Uh, but that's not surprising. That's just a normal animal model that's been developed to, as a lethal infection. Uh, the, the point I want to make about this slide is that there's this one bar here that goes out eight days. That one mice, that one mouse is like our hero mouse. <laughs> And um, that mouse actually built up a sufficient immune response that it was able to fight off that infection on its own. And in fact, in, in the experiment that I'm describing here, this mouse, we eventually, when we analyzed it, all the, the lung titers were completely clean. Um, it, it actually had built up uh, an immune response. And if you reinfected that mouse, it would have survived uh, much more effectively because it had built up its immune response. Why, why does the immune response work so well? Um, and that's a uh, number of cells, basically, and the body's immune system um, recruits these cells to go fight off these infections. And macrophages are the ones I'll be talking about specifically uh, in this talk. Macrophages are cells and part of the immune system that can do kind of one of two things. They'll either induce an inflammatory response. Uh, the inflammatory response is uh, the body's way of signaling that it needs more help. Um, or they'll gobble up the bacteria, uh, so-called. So phagocytic uh, macrophages. And so um, sometimes if you get an infection, those macrophages will invade the lungs and the, the, the swelling will be too much. Uh, the in inflammatory response will be too great. And, and actually, most of these mice died because of the macrophage response, the inflammation associated with the infection, not the specific toxins that the bacteria were putting out on their own. So the, the point is, and this one hero mouse here, was able to actually build up enough response to suppress that inflammatory response, get enough of it so that it could build up a, a cure, uh, and then uh, uh, build up enough macrophages of the other kind and other uh, neutrophils and other cells that could then fight off uh, the disease. Okay, so how are we gonna do this uh, with nanomaterials? Uh, so uh, the, the story I'm gonna tell is mostly um, focused on these kind of three elements. Uh, the first one, uh, is uh, targeting peptides. So the idea is that we're going to try to deliver something to those macrophage cells to turn them on, to actually flip them over from M1 to M2 type macrophage. And, and so to do that, we have to get something that's is kind of a specific programming for the cell. Uh, and our programming, again, is not lines of code, it's uh, peptides. And these are peptides we get from Erki Ruizlati's group. Um, we worked with him for now over 10 years, um, and the one I'll talk about a couple of different peptides in my talk. Uh, CARG is one that actually will, will specifically target uh, staph aureus infected uh, lungs. Uh, you attach that little fishing lure to the end of a, uh, a tether and attach that to a nanoparticle. Uh, the nanoparticles I'm gonna talk about are these porous structures. They're gonna be carrying a payload and delivering that to the cells. Um, and we'll either be delivering it to the Staph aureus itself or we'll be delivering it to macrophages, as I mentioned. Um, and then um, finally, if there's some therapeutic in there, then depending on where you deliver it, you might be able to affect a, a, a reasonable um, a cure or at least a response that's uh, beneficial to the, to the organism. All right, uh, so the silicon structures that we make in my lab are based on uh, silicon uh, that's etched out of single crystal wafers. Uh, the process is kind of outlined here. This is an etched cell. That's a silicon wafer. Uh, we machine it electrochemically to provide uh, these uh, open porous structures that are shown in these various images. Uh, I've got a video showing uh, the next one here. So this is kind of how we do it. Um, and there's a little wafer there. Uh, we put it in the etched cell. We run electric current through it. Those bubbles are actually hydrogen gas, drilling holes in the silicon. Uh, these holes are very, very small. They're typically on the order of about 10 nanometers with about a 10 nanometer pore wall thickness. Um, we make that porous layer, we lift it off, we break it up by ultrasound, uh, and then we can uh, deliver those particles via uh, syringe. Uh, and the cool thing about these structures is although they're, they're particulate by appearance, um, deep inside they're, they're quite open and, and highly porous. Um, and so just to kind of summarize that in a cartoon fashion, this is the materials uh, that we, we make and we'll be talking about. It's a silicon-based nanoparticle. On the average, about 200 nanometers, small enough to be able to circulate through the bloodstream. Porosity is about 60%. And just, uh, just for the, my own edification, we did the calculation. Uh, and so if you look at that particle of that size, 
and uh, that porosity, it, it ends up being about 200 million silicon atoms in that, totally in that structure. So more atoms than you can actually count reasonably, but uh, a pretty finite, fairly, fairly small number. And the important thing about those 200 million atoms is that we can do chemistry with them. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is the silicon itself is a reducing agent. Um, and it can be reduced uh, actually uh, negative of the normal hydrogen electrode. If you're not an electrochemist, what that means is it will spontaneously reduce water and generate hydrogen gas. Uh, so it's a good reducing agent. Um, it's also uh, reasonably easily oxidized, even with simple besides electrochemically, you can also just oxidize it, as I mentioned just a second ago, with water. And so uh, this material is, is, is an unstable material and ultimately wants to go to silicon dioxide. And a lot of my story, uh, my nano story here is gonna focus on these two um, forms of silicon, silicon and silicon dioxide. Uh, so uh, I already mentioned these two reactions. The third one I wanna mention just before we uh, get into the details is uh, the, uh, the, la the, uh, the oxidation reaction itself. Uh, this oxide can actually then be redissolved. So this, is, this last reaction here is something that's uh, a little bit foreign to most of us who are used to like not having our windows dissolve <laughs> when it rains. Uh, of course, windows, glass is made out of silicon dioxide. Uh, but actually in its nano form, silicon dioxide will dissolve. And in fact, this orthosilicate, SiOH taken four times, uh, that's the bioavailable form of silicon. We all have about five parts per million of that in our bloodstream, uh, 10 to 20 parts per million of that in our bones. Um, so uh, silicon does uh, actually dissolve. Uh, it's just that it takes a long time, uh, kinetically slow when it's in a massive form like glass. Uh, and uh, the structures themselves, I mentioned they're, they're porous. I, I just, this is actually from my house, um, <laughs> the one on the right. Uh, this last summer we had termites and we had to, the guy came with his two by four and he goes, oh here you've got termites, see? And there's like powder falling out of the thing and it had all these holes in it. And, and um, so I like, oh great, can I have that piece? And I, I cut it and painted it nicely and, and I put it next to a two by four. And so the, the, the point of this is that, that this actually, we measure this, the porosity of this thing is, uh, 57%. And so uh, that's actually the porosity of the silicon structures I'm talking about are between 50 and 60% today. Uh, and so you'd think that that's a lot of empty space, but in fact, our house was still standing. Um, and um, similarly with these nanostructures, um, even with a very high porosity like that, you have a lot of structural integrity in those, is, those nanomaterials. And actually the, the process for drilling out silicon, although it's electrochemical, uh, is, is quite analogous to termites eating through wood. Um, you have what's called open porosity exclusively. There's no closed pores inside that structure. They're drilled out electrochemically, so just like worms crawling into wood, all the holes and the open space is accessible to the outside. And that's good, because we can use that then to load uh, payloads and molecules into those holes. Okay, so one other property of the silicon that I, I really want to talk about just for a few minutes is um, this, uh, 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 the image here, this is a picture of a vial of the silicon uh, nanoparticles uh, in solution, dispersed. Um, and on the right, you have a luminescent uh, picture. So these are the silicon nanoparticles under a black light. Uh, they have an intrinsic photoluminescence. And uh, the, that photoluminescence is coming from quantum confinement. And in the nanostructures that, that I'm talking about here, you have a fairly large, again, maybe 200 nanometer particle, um, but it's a little, um, microstructure, the small features of silicon that are left behind during that etching process that, that gives rise to these more or less two nanometer type domains that give you the photoluminescence. So it's, it's neat in that way. It's actually a, a photoluminescent, intrinsically photoluminescent material. So if we want to put these into an animal and circulate them around and, and see where they are, um, we don't have to attach a fluorescent dye or a magnetic nanoparticle if you're doing MRI. Um, we can actually directly image them, and that's shown here. Uh, so these are nanoparticles made out of porous silicon that were injected into a mouse in the tail vein. They circulated for some time. We put the animal on a light table, and uh, there's a tumor in the back of the hind quarter of the mouse there, and these nanoparticles accumulated in that tumor. And you can see this, these false color um, intensity maps here show the proximity of the, of the um, nanoparticles to the tumor. They um, accumulated in the tumor. I'll get to why that is in a minute. Um, main point here is that these things are actually luminescent. 
Uh, and getting back to my story about how the robots have to go away after they're done, um, we followed this over 24 hours, and the particles, although they lodged in the tumor, uh, dissolved away after about three days. They were completely undetectable. So uh, it's a silicon material that has its own luminescence, uh, so you can track it, um, and it's biocompatible. Uh, one of the challenges of tracking things in luminescence is shown in this picture in, in sort of a cartoony fashion. So the, the orange there, or the reddish orange that you see there is the silicon nanoparticles, and the rest of this is the finger of the student. This was not approved by me, by the way. This is, <laughs> he did this and gave me the picture. Um, uh, I guess this probably should have been approved by, for human subjects at use. But anyway, he did it. He took, took the picture and showed it to me. Uh, and uh, the, the important thing of this picture is that you see all this white stuff there. Well, the, the finger was under a black light and you know, it was lighting up. That's called tissue autofluorescence. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges in identifying any kind of fluorescent tag um, in the background of, of tissues that are fluorescent. Uh, brain tissues, tumor tissues, the liver, uh, lots of tissues in the body have this autofluorescence. So how do you get rid of that? Well, you could go to really high concentration, like I did in that last picture, um, or you can time gate it. Uh, and so the silicon dots are in a vial here on the right, the cadmium selenide dots, just as a control, a kind of a comparison or on the left. Um, silicon's an indirect gap semiconductor, which means that it actually has a very long-lived excited state. And so when you, you pump it with light at time equals zero nanoseconds, and then wait for about 2,000 nanoseconds, so two microseconds later, um, the dots made out of silicon are still glowing, um, but the cadmium selenide dots are completely turned off. So actually, if you were just to take a picture and delay by a, a few uh, hundreds of nanoseconds, you can actually identify the silicon in the background of a lot of uh, other fluorescent materials. And the main reason for that is tissue autofluorescence, most organic dyes, uh, most other things, even other kinds of quantum dots, if they derive from direct gap semiconductors, have very short-lived excited states, typically on the order of a, a nanosecond or, or so. Um, and then um, if, but these are decay traces here, just showing a comparison. This is a Psi 3.5. It's an organic dye we use typically in, in imaging. And on the left is a porous silicon uh, nanoparticles. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the time scale here is, you know, 80 times 10 to the 3 rather than 8. Uh, so it's massively longer-lived uh, excited state for the silicon. So that really enables the time gating. Um, recently, we published this um, a couple years ago now where we showed that we could use this time gating to really improve the contrast in images. And just to quickly walk you through these charts, up on the top were just a bunch of organ sections taken from uh, con two control animals and one animal with a tumor that we were targeting. Um, and then the bottom is the same set of organs but imaged by time gating. And, and the main point I want to illustrate is, let's take a look at, for instance, the kidney here, these three animals. This kidney here uh, is from an animal that was injected with nothing. Uh, it's a control animal. So the, the glow you kind of see there is basically the tissue autofluorescence I was just talking about. Um, if you time gate it, of course, it goes away, and so you don't see anything. Um, this bright patch here is, is from the nanoparticles in the tumor, but you may not believe me if I tell you that in this steady state image can say, well, there's a lot of intensity in this control animal in the kidney, so why do you know that that's silicon? You don't. But if you time gate it, um, then everything else gets extinguished and you only see uh, the emission from the tumor uh, that has the silicon nanoparticles. So this time gating allows you to really identify where and track uh, where those silicon nanoparticles are. Uh, roughly, you know, there's bleed through still in these kinds of images, but you roughly you get about a hundred fold increase in, in signal to noise ratio if you time gate uh, based on this, this kind of methodology. Um, okay, now I want to talk a little bit about some of the chemistry that's used to, to, to control luminescence in silicon. And this goes back to a very old paper uh, now, many years ago. Uh, after Lee Canham discovered luminescence from silicon back in the 1990, early, early 90s, um, a couple years later, a group, Volker Lehman, Fred Koch, and their uh, team uh, published this paper where they said, oh, we can actually improve luminescence of silicon. Um, and here's the data they had. Um, they had a photoluminescence spectrum of the as-prepared material, and they cooked it in the oven for nine, at 900 degrees for an hour or so, um, and the luminescence increased. Uh, and that 
was and now we know is just what we call core shell uh, types of nanoparticles. They were growing a, a passivating oxide shell on the silicon, passivating surface traps like um, dangling bond centers or, or oxygen uh, vacancy centers um, that give rise to non-radiative uh, quenching of luminescence. And so by growing an oxide shell, you can really enhance the luminescence of silicon. That was the first example of that. And we've really <laughs> capitalized on that tremendously. We do take a lot of advantage of, of growing these thin oxide shells on silicon to improve luminescence. And this is just a small cartoon showing that. So the silicon that I've been talking about with you guys so far has been pretty much as prepared. We cook it a little bit, either sometimes just soaking it in water, is, as I said, is enough to oxidize it. It grows a pretty reasonably passivating oxide shell and it enhances the luminescence uh, by sometimes quite a bit. Um, the uh, other thing that is important to keep in mind is as this oxide grows, if you're doing this in water, the oxide can also dissolve, and I've tried to illustrate that with this cartoon. Um, and that is that we've grown an oxide layer, that kind of lighter color there on, the, on those pillars of silicon. Um, but if it's in water, especially if it's under sort of basic conditions, that oxide will start to dissolve and it'll expose fresh silicon and eventually you'll dissolve your material away completely. But as you do that, you shift the band gap of the material because your quantum dots are getting smaller. And so it, it provides you with some control of the, of the spectral properties. But, but most importantly for this talk is this concept I'm calling autophagic. Um, what do I mean by that? So autophagy in, in, in cell biology is when the cell gets into trouble, it's in stress conditions or for various reasons, um, it will start eating itself. Auto means you know, itself and phagy means eating. And so the cell will start eating its own proteins basically to try to change over its, uh, into a different cell cycle or to just to survive from starvation conditions and so forth. Um, and this autophagic concept I'm think makes sense to, to talk about in the context of these silicon structures. Because what's happening here is these guys are you know, dissolving away. They're not eating themselves per se, they're just dissolving. Um, but you can actually take that dissolution reaction and harness it and, and make something new, just like an, an autophagic cell will take those proteins and recycle them into something new and useful for, it, for the cell's uh, survival. And that is that we take this silicon, dissolve it to the silicic acid, if we do it in the, in, the, in the presence of a high concentration of calcium ion, uh, actually it forms a precipitate. And um, it, it's uh, actually calcium silicate is 80% of Portland cement. So uh, this really does like cement things into the pores. <laughs> um, what's happening here is the silicon is dissolving, makes silicic acid, that silicic acid in the presence of high calcium ion or magnesium ion will then re-precipitate in a sort of calcium, mixed calcium oxide silicate, which is again, typically the composition of cement. So it's a very, very stable material, and, and it's a good way to, 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 to recycle the silicon into some other type of structure. And I'll show you why that's important here uh, in the next couple of slides. The idea is that we wanna use that chemistry to load a gene, and that we're gonna use that gene then as an as a, um, antibacterial agent. Um, and the, the material we're gonna load is a siRNA, an interfering uh, R RNA sequence, um, and we're gonna load it in this calcium silicate, uh, and then we're gonna put a targeting peptide on there, and I'll then put those nanoparticles into a mouse, and we'll talk about that. Let's talk about the loading first. Uh, the oligonucleotides are, are highly negatively charged, and what's shown on the left part of this chart uh, is just some, some uh, a simple cartoon of a study that uh, Michelle Chen did in my lab many years ago now where uh, she was trying to load different molecules into these pores and she had problems. And the main problem was that um, the surface of silicon oxide is, is very negative unless you're down at pH one. Uh, so under normal conditions when you wanna load a protein or biomolecule, uh, the surface is highly negatively charged. Uh, and that's kind of illustrated with this right-hand side image. Uh, so if the payload is negatively charged like an oligonucleotide like siRNA or DNA, uh, it doesn't load very well. In fact, it goes in and it repels itself and it's repelled from the walls and we got very low loading. Um, she found if she had a positively charged protein, of course it loaded quite well and that was kind of what she wrote her paper on. Um, but then this problem came up again when we tried to load these uh, DNA or RNA oligos. And uh, 
A couple of different ways you can think about um, fixing that problem. You could go to high salt concentration, help to screen the surface charge that, um, uh, you know, that, that repels those, those species. Um, or you can utilize the surface charge by aminating it, do some kind of chemistry on it. Um, or you can actually just coat it with calcium. Uh, calcium also affiliates with DNA and RNA, uh, so it will ion pair with that material, it will reduce its charge, and also, as I just told you, this precipitation reaction can occur to actually help lock it into the pores. And um, so, you, this turns out this will also work with magnesium. You can either use calcium or magnesium. It actually works pretty well, um, and I'll show you the data on that in, in a second here. Uh, so, the, the basic roadmap is we'll take our porous material, it has some oxide in it, we put it in a solution with siRNA and calcium ion and uh, let it go, sit for a while. Uh, it, uh, the RNA goes into the pores, the calcium ion uh, precipitates with the silicate and it seals them in there. And this is what it looks like in, in, uh, in by TEM and, and uh, adsorption isotherm measurements. Uh, these are the empty particles here. You kind of see the pore structure. That's kind of a top-down picture of the silicon. The pores tend to be very uh, anisotropic. They go in one direction in the material. Uh, and so that's what they looked like beforehand. If we just add, do the calcium chemistry, you can see they get kind of cloudier. Um, you can't d define the pores as well. Uh, this is consistent with the calcium silicate formation. Uh, it also works if there's siRNA in the solution. And we've done separate assays with dye-labeled siRNA to show that the siRNA gets loaded in there actually to quite a high percent. If we look at the adsorption isotherms on these materials, um, by loading with calcium, we've really shut down the pore structure. We, we block the pores significantly. We, we, we reduce the surface area quite a bit. And that's shown in these two traces before the empty particles have a pretty high surface area, uh, typically you know, upwards of 200, more than 200 meters squared per gram. Um, and then the calcium ion uh, chemistry, when that goes in, it drops it. It also tends to uh, form this passivating shell, as I mentioned, that, that, that enhances the luminescence. So the photoluminescence of the samples before calcium loading is, is you know, detectable, but it goes up quite a bit um, when we uh, load. And it's typical quantum yield at the peak here is about 20% um, quantum yield for emission. Um, and so uh, it worked. Uh, uh, and what was really interesting about this approach was that there, there are not many good ways to load oligonucleotides into nanoparticles because of this self-charge problem. That all, the oligonucleotides repel each other. They don't like to get loaded into small spaces. Uh, people like Chad Merkin have used um, the, the spherical nucleic acid approach, taking gold nanoparticles that covalently bound uh, RNA to those surfaces. Um, same kind of concept, basically driving that loading with chemistry. In this case, the calcium silicate chemistry gives us about 20 to 25 percent loading. Um, if you just compare that to things like lipid-based nanoparticles or, or mesoporous silicas uh, published in other, uh, other areas, other groups, uh, we did a kind of a survey between 2008 and now, um, and uh, typically uh, you get maybe up to about 15 percent loading uh, of any uh, substantial amount of oligonucleotide um, in these other types of nanoparticles. So this really does give us a good you know, a good way of loading oligos. Uh, it's superior to anything that we've been able to, to find in the literature. Uh, now, I, I mentioned already we're going to then now attach our targeting peptide to these things, and these are identified by my collaborator, Erki Ruoslati, using an in vivo phage display. So he takes an, uh, a, a library of phage, he in, in, in inoculates an animal that already has a disease, uh, and then after a while, some of these phage will selectively target and attach to the lungs uh, for whatever reason. You take the phage out, amplify it in bacteria, and then through multiple screening cycles, you can find peptides that were associated with that, one of those phage molecules in that library that will bind to the tissues. Uh, he's done this for a lot of different areas, cancer, um, cardiovascular diseases, uh, uh, different kinds of brain uh, afflictions and, and, and infections. And so we did two models. Uh, Pseudomonas and the Staph aureus, and I'll talk about the Staph aureus data uh, in the last few minutes of my talk today. So um, the first thing we tried with these things was kind of going back to the, the, um, the nanoparticles here. The, 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 the recipe here was to load this 
with just a conventional antibiotic, kind of like a control experiment. So can we deliver an antibiotic like vancomycin, which is one of the frontline antibiotics for Staph aureus? Uh, if you get a MRSA infection, you'll probably get, likely you'll get treated with vancomycin. Um, can we load that into the particles and then target it? And will that be more effective than just giving the patient vancomycin on its own? So let's just validate whether this targeting concept works. Um, and here's the data. Uh, so the experiment was performed as follows. We have mice, we inject them uh, intra tracheally with the, uh, the infection at day zero, so they have infected lungs uh, with uh, Staph aureus. Um, and then on day one, we inject via the tail vein, as shown here, um, the nanoparticle formulation. And if you look at the PBS, that's uh, just a saline injection, a control. As I mentioned, you know, maybe one of these animals survives out to day eight, uh, but the rest of them die pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, if we just give regular vancomycin the standard dose uh, that would be given uh, typical for the, the, the mass of the animals and the, the, the infection, uh, you know, we, we only rescue about 30% of the animals. Uh, but then if we load it with this targeting peptide in porous silicon containing vancomycin, um, the red dots there show that it actually rescued all of the animals uh, and they all survived. And, uh, lung titers uh, at day 20 or so when we finally sacrificed the animals showed no signs of Staph aureus infection and the lungs had healed. Uh, and so what this just shows is that you can, if you can target that vancomycin directly to the diseased tissue, um, you know, the average concentration of the drug will be higher and, and it actually works more efficiently. And, and that's how we in interpret that, that result. Okay. So uh, vancomycin works, uh, and it works better if you target it and, and load it in a nanoparticle. Um, coming back to this, this problem that I started it's with now, can we use the body's own immune system to fight that infection? Okay, so how are we gonna do that? And I already mentioned um, we're gonna start with this, we're using this lung infection, and we're gonna be um, trying to harness the macrophages uh, in the animal's uh, immune system. And, and the way to do that is um, instead of using the targeting peptide that goes after bacteria, which I showed in that previous set of data, Erkey identified a second peptide uh, that targets macrophages. Um, and in fact, he found it in a, in a tumor screen. There was a, a, a peptide that targets tumor-associated macrophages, but we used it and he found it worked in this model as well. And, and the idea is that you have this nanoparticle that, that can uh, bind to the macrophages. Um, when it, when it hits the macrophages, if we can deliver uh, siRNA, we can actually switch those cells over into a, a different uh, cycle where they'll become more phagocytic and less uh, inflammatory. And so that's kind of the, the basic concept. Uh, the way we did this, again, is with the silicon nanoparticles. Here we loaded, uh, we, we coated the structure with uh, a, a, a um, a phospholipid that's so-called fusogenic phospholipid. Um, these were developed not by our group, by other groups. Uh, turns out that some lipids won't just go into the cell. They actually sit on the cell surface and they open up uh, so-called fusogenic. They fuse with the, the lipid membrane of the cell um, and deposit their payload directly into the cytosol. For gene delivery or, or RNA delivery, that's really good. You don't want the cells to be um, taken up uh, in the endosomes and then digested by the lysosomes. The, the, uh, the, the, the nanomaterial and, the, and the, the payload has to be delivered directly to the cytosol to be effective. And escaping the endosome is one of the critical problems of gene and, and, and RNA delivery um, in mammalian systems. Okay, so that's the, the concept. So again, we're using this, 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 this coated particle. We've got our targeting peptide. There's some um, fusogenic liposome coating around there that it's kind of not very sh shown very well. And this little pink stuff there is our siRNA payload. Um, and uh, we tested it in cells, it worked. Actually, it, it was able to knock down, uh, uh, the, we, this was a PPIB gene that we were knocking down um, in this experiment. And just concentrate on that bar there, that's, that's our fusogenic formulation. And, and the knockdown, or the ability to suppress gene expression um, was as, effective as using lipofectamine, which is a standard um, gene, gene transfection agent that's used in petri dishes. Um, you'd like to use it in vivo, but it's highly toxic and it won't work in vivo um, for lipofectamine. And so 
the fact that this nanoparticle behaved as well as lipofectamine in a petri dish was a good sign that it might work uh, in vivo as well. And in fact, then we went into the animals and found out that it did work. And so now here is the experiment, uh, very similar type of experiment in this case, basically all the animals died within four days. Uh, uh, again, it's a lung infection model, um, and we're targeting these fusogenic nanoparticles not to the disease itself, but to the macrophages, and forcing them over into their phagocytic um, character, characteristic. Um, and in that case, then, we could get, um, you know, the, the yellow bars here is, is the actual experiment. The fusogenic formulation with IRF5 is the, is the actual gene we delivered. CRV is the targeting peptide. Um, and actually rescued all six of the animals in that particular control group, or that particular uh, test group. Uh, so uh, it actually worked. And what was amazing to this, we thought we were going to have to actually use this in, in conjunction with vancomycin. <laughs> That's why I showed you the vancomycin data first. We thought, well, you know, we could probably boost the vancomycin's effect by knocking down the macrophage activity a little bit, uh, the, the um, inflammatory activity a little bit. Uh, and instead, we found that actually it worked without even using any vancomycin at all. In fact, in this model, uh, vancomycin, the, the standard dose, would uh, only rescue about 30% of the animals. So two out of six animals would survive with the vancomycin course. And so here, we're, we're rescuing all the animals with just an siRNA. And that's really the first time that's ever been done uh, with, uh, uh, you know, to actually cured an animal of a lethal uh, uh, in infection. Uh, and so that, that was really, we were really excited about that. Okay, so I just now kind of wrap up my story. Um, I tried to convince you guys that I'm working on like science fiction, I guess. Um, and I had these three laws of nanorobotics. Uh, the first, remember, was that the robot should not be toxic and the silicon, I Spent a little time talking about the, the data in the silicon system and how it dissolves to these harmless uh, silicic acid material that is already available in your body. Uh, the programming we did using targeting peptides and the chemistry of that calcium silicate that allowed it to dissolve once it got into the cell uh, and deliver the payload. And uh, finally, the self-destructing, which is all of those materials then dissolved and degraded once they were delivered. Uh, so, and that, and just to kind of in words, uh, also I should point out uh, the photoluminescence is a really, really nice handle with the silicon system and allowing you to track those materials. Um, the time gating, I showed you an example where we can time gate the fluorescence because silicon has such a long lived excited state, you can really suppress background fluorescence from tissues. Uh, so, that tells you where your particles are. Um, then, the targeting, we used all these uh, peptide. Um, targeting groups uh, that uh, we were able to, in, in several instances now, uh, target the nanoparticles to specific locations in the body. And I introduced this concept of autophagic nanoparticles, or particles that actually eat themselves up in a, in a way that's beneficial, that form, forces them into a different type of phase, different, different uh, chemical composition, allows them, in this case, to, to hold on to an oligonucleotide payload uh, very effectively at very high high uh, mass loadings, um, and that the dissolution chemistry of the silicon then and this calcium silicate, uh, all of those components are non-toxic uh, components. And finally, just to demonstrate that the whole thing works, it showed how we could target those nanoparticles, uh, delivering siRNA that actually cured uh, animals of a Staph aureus infection. So uh, just to thank my coworkers, this is a highly collaborative type of project, as you can imagine. Uh, my group really is more the material science group, uh, but the, I've got a lot of really good biotype people in my lab. Jin Young Kang and BJ Kim were the two that did most of the work uh, in the bacterial infection work that you heard about, along with Jimmy Ju, who he did the data uh, using uh, vancomycin. It's all done in, in strong collaboration with uh, Erky Roslati at the Sanford Burnham Institute in San Diego and Sangeeta Bhatia at, at MIT in bioengineering department there. And uh, thank you for your attention.